If you have your Bible, I would encourage you to open them up to Psalm chapter, I mean, Proverbs chapter 1. So here's the plan. The plan is we're going to have some fun in Proverbs for several weeks. And then we're going to go to what Dot has been waiting for, 1 Corinthians. I was in 1 Corinthians when I left the village. We're going to start over. So you might hear some repeats of some things, but I'll try to make it as fresh as possible. Uh, that's going to be a book that's uh, it's tough. If I preach it as God's word speaks it, all of us will have our toes stomped on. So, so just be prepared for that. I, I don't preach to hurt feelings, but I certainly don't preach to minimize the truth of God's word. So please... Uh, Please come with your steel toe shoes <laughs> and your, your plowed up heart ready to receive the word of God. But today and for the next several Sundays, we're going to be looking at Proverbs. And today we're just going to look at the first seven verses of Proverbs. The title of the sermon is Why Proverbs? The pro- oh, English Standard Version beginning today. Yes. <laughs> My wife is excited about that. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning. And the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. If you don't already know it, Proverbs is uh, it's right, it's right close to the top, if not at the top of my list of my favorite books of the Bible. I try to read a proverb, a chapter of Proverbs every day. There's 30 chapters of Proverbs. So most months you can read a proverb a day and you're good through the month. So you can read through Proverbs 12 times a year. And uh, that's important as we're going to learn uh, today. If there's, a, if there's a 31 in the month, I am right. It's Prover- Proverbs has 30 chapters, right? Oh, it has 31 chapters. Okay. Well, every now and then I'll take a, a day and I'll just read the highlights. I like to highlight my Bible and I'll just go through Proverbs and read the highlights of, of what I've highlighted. Anyway, it's a, it's a very easy book to read. It's very practical. Uh, and it's uh, very valuable in, 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 its, in its instruction for life. We're not going to be going verse by verse through the entire book. That it, Proverbs isn't meant to go verse by verse uh, in that way. Uh, but we will look at some of the major themes in the book of Proverbs. We'll look at our mouth. We'll look at our finances. Um, and other things that uh, I, th- I find to be very interesting. Even, even that age-old discussion of sovereignty and free will. Did you know that that's in Proverbs. That's interesting. Who wrote the book of Proverbs? Well, the main author is Solomon. There are some others in there, but Solomon is the one that we're told today. Remember Solomon was King David's son? His mother was Bathsheba. Uh, he became the, the third king of Israel. Can you name the first two? Saul and David. Uh, He became the third king of Israel. He built the temple in Jerusalem. He built a lot of cities in Israel. And uh, when, when King Solomon took the throne, God told Solomon to ask for anything and God would give it to him. And you, re- you remember he asked for discernment and wisdom to lead the people of Israel as their king. And God granted that wish. And Solomon to this day is known as the 
wisest man of all time. He accomplished many wonderful things, and he studied every subject he could study. He, he was, he was uh, intrigued with all of God's creation and tried to learn as much about it as possible. So he became a man of, of great knowledge and great wealth also, but also great wisdom. Solomon tried everything there was to try to bring happiness, to bring purpose and success in life. And in his latter years, he veered off the track of wisdom. And he delved into some very foolish things, including idolatry. Made some very foolish decisions. So here's a man who lived life probably fuller than most people. And he's giving us his words of wisdom here. Verses 2 through 6 of this chapter give us the purpose behind writing the book of Proverbs. Verse 2, it says, for attaining wisdom. That word wisdom, Solomon uses 42 times in the book of Proverbs. The very root meaning of that word is simply skill. If you go back to uh, uh, Exodus, God is um, telling Moses about building the, the tabernacle, you know, doing all the gold and um, carving and all that kind of stuff. Uh, he says in verse 35, chapter 35, 35, he, God, has filled them with skill to do all kinds of work as craftsmen. Same word, wisdom. Uh, designers, embroiders in purple, or blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, and weavers, all of them master craftsmen and designers. That's the, that's the natural meaning of this word for wisdom. So wisdom is the ability to do something. It is not just the knowledge of how to do it. It is the ability to do it. Many of us know how to change a tire, but can we? Many of us know how to draw a picture, but can we? Hmm, that's the question. When the word is used as it is here to talk about general life characteristics, it means the skill of living life according to a set of standards. The skill of living life according to a set of standards. And in the context of God's word, a wise person is one who knows God's standards and lives life according to God's standards. A wise person is one who is skilled in knowing God's, God's way of living and actually living that way. It is not Confucius with this abstract understanding of the world. Wisdom is not ab abstract. It is very concrete. It's not simply having right answers. We call a wise person, you know, you go to a wise person for advice. That's not the way the Bible uses wisdom. I mean, you can get some answers that way, but that's more. If you want to be a wise person, it's not just about having the right answers. It's about doing those right answers, living those right answers. It isn't knowledge, although a wise person will have plenty of knowledge. Wisdom is the actual living of life according to God's standards. Living life as God intended it to be lived. Uh, in, in Peterson's um, paraphrase of the Bible called The Message, he says, uh, he says this, uh, this verse here says, written down so we will know how to live well and right, attaining wisdom. Written down so we'll know how to live well and right. Now, wisdom is something that's normally achieved by age. We look at the gray hair and we say they're wise. But that's not necessarily true because you can be an old fool. It's not out of the question either that a young person could be wise. A fool. A fool is one 
who either does not know God's standards and therefore doesn't live according to them, but more appropriately, a fool is one who knows God's standards and doesn't live accordingly. A fool is a person who goes to church every Sunday but doesn't live what they hear from God's word on Sunday. Now, connected with wisdom in this verse is discipline. Other versions of your, the Bible may, may say uh, instruction. It, it's really because this word can mean both. Instruction and discipline, they're, they're, they're both joined in this one Hebrew word. And, um, the idea is that within the book of Proverbs, we will receive teaching that will inform and will rebuke us, discipline us, and will follow, if we follow these instructions, we will gain discipline, we'll gain self-control in our moral conduct of life. Discipline or instruction is absolutely crucial to being wise. One of the themes we're going to look at is the willingness to be corrected. If you are not will, willing to be corrected, Proverbs calls you a fool. If you're not willing to be corrected, you'll never be wise. Solomon goes on to say, for understanding words of insight. I, I really like the way the New American Standard Version puts it here. It says, to discern the sayings of understanding. Literally, you could read this verse, to understand or discern the sayings of discernment or truth. It's really a lot of words that mean in the same things there. The root meaning is to discern between two things. It's like Paul, uh, Solomon's wisdom when the two ladies came to him with the one baby and they had had one baby that had been killed. His discernment, his wisdom was the ability to figure it out whose baby was still alive. The teaching that Solomon gives us in this book will help us discern between that which is true and that which is false. Folks, if there is anything Christians need today, it is discernment. What is true and what is false. There is so much being promoted in churches that call themselves Christian today that is not biblical but people are just hoodwinked and they just line up, excuse me, line up by the millions to be involved in it. The health and wealth and prosperity gospel is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. To think that we are going to be people who never have to suffer, who never have to endure financial causes, you know, financial um, needs, it's just not scriptural. If we are following Jesus Christ, Paul makes it very clear, you will be persecuted. Being a Christian does not take us out of this world. It does not take away the things that sin has caused in this world. It gives us Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, to walk with us through those things. Wasn't planning on saying all that, but it really irks me. These folks who call themselves Christian teachers, and they're not teaching the Bible whatsoever. We need to be able to discern between that which is good and that which is evil. That which is wise and that which is foolish. And this book of Proverbs will do that. You know, uh, one that comes to my mind, better a friend nearby than a brother far away. I mean, that's right. Verse 3, again, I, I like the Amer New American Standard. To receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, or that which is fair. That's a pretty self-explaining verse. The Proverbs will show us what wise behavior looks like. Instruction in wise behavior. A wise man, we're going to find it throughout Proverbs, a wise man does such and such, but a fool does such and such. They'll teach us how to live a righteous life. Living a righteous life is living life right before God and right before man. And it's also going to learn what justice and fairness 
really look like. Not what our world thinks justice and fairness is, but what true justice and fairness is. Forgiving prudence to the simple, or if you prefer, the naive. The simple one or the naive person is one who is easily deceived, easily persuaded. They follow quite quickly without giving much thought to their ways. They have a lack of wisdom and understanding. To give prudence to someone means to to enable them to live shrewdly, enable them to leave, live thinking about their decisions, understanding their decisions without being deceived or persuaded by that which is wrong. Knowledge and discretion to the young. Listen up, young people. This word knowledge is loaded, I mean absolutely loaded with with meaning. It means general knowledge, it means moral awareness, and it also means a, a knowledge of the presence of God. Discretion means to be a person of thought and intent, to not just willy-nilly make decisions, but to use discretion compared with evil and, and, and right and good and bad, to give thought and purpose. Young people, we are told, will gain knowledge. They will receive a moral compass and gain knowledge of God as they read through Proverbs. If the things in this book are put into practice, they'll live a life with purpose, thinking about what they do and making decisions with God's way, in God's ways. And doing so, they'll gain knowledge, experiential knowledge of God. So young people, you want to know God? Read Proverbs and do it. Do it. Of course... That's true for adults also. Verses 5 and 6 give us some general, generic purposes. A wise person will listen and add to their learning. That's always true of a wise person. They've trained themselves to always be learning. They've trained themselves to always listen rather than jumping to conclusions. They're always improving. A wise person is always willing to be corrected, always willing to be discerning in order to gain greater guidance. The Proverbs themselves speak truth, and they will guide us if we're willing to listen to them. For understanding Proverbs, parables, the sayings, and riddles of the wise ones, Maybe not the first time through, but yeah, over time, that's going to happen to you. You're going to understand the Proverbs. You're going to understand the parables. You're going to understand the the riddles that are mingled within these verses in this book. So if I had to summarize the purpose of the book of Proverbs in just one sentence, this is what I would say. The book of Proverbs is written to help us live life as God intended us to live it. The book of Proverbs is written to help us live life as God intended us to live it. So why study Proverbs? That's a pretty silly question now, isn't it? If we want to live as God intended us to live, it's a really great book to study. And Solomon closes this introductory material by giving us probably the most important lesson that we can learn on how to be wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Elsewhere it'll say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The word for knowledge here is that same word used up in verse 4. General knowledge, moral compass, knowledge of God. This verse tells us that in order for us to have a, a proper view of knowledge in general, We need to fear God. Knowledge in general, science, the things of this earth, the world, the rules that are in in place. God created everything. If we leave God out of anything, we do not know as we could know or as we should know. 
God is the source of everything good. In order to have a moral compass, we need to know God because he is the source of everything good. And that's what we want to know. And in order to truly know God, to have a proper view of God, we have to approach him as God. And Solomon says that the appropriate way to approach God is with fear. What do you think about that? God is completely self-sufficient. He needs no one. He is the creator and the sustainer and the ruler over all things. He spoke. Now, get, get at a place in your mind right now where you're not just hearing words you've heard all your life. God spoke. And the world came to be. It was in darkness, and he said, let there be light. He now controls every movement of his world. And he is bringing everything to its appointed end. He is creator, sovereign ruler over all things. He holds within his hands life and death. Every breath we breathe is a gift from him. And you could go on and on and on and on about who God is. We can't ever fully <laughs> fully uh, explain him or, or describe him. Now let me ask you. If this morning the Taliban came through here and those guys came down here and they said to all of us, get down on your knees with their guns, you know, in their hands. Would you be scared? They have the, they have the power of life and death in their hands right then and there to kill us. Would you be scared? Yeah. That's the same kind of fear that this fear can mean, okay? And I want to say to you that if you're just pretending your religion, if you're just trying to fool God or your parents or someone else, you need to be scared to death of God. As uh, Livingston, I think it was, a sinner in the hands of of an angry God. You don't want to be there. That word fear can mean that kind of fear. And, and honestly, folks, even as Christians, we need to have that kind of understanding of who God is. He's not just some thing that we can choose to do without. He's God. He's God. And he's coming again. And all those who've just flipped him off, it's not going to be good. When we know Jesus as our Savior, there, I believe there is still a certain amount of genuine fear about God simply because he is God. We don't fear, fear that he's going to take our life, but... But he's God. I, mean, I don't know how else to describe it. You're standing before one so powerful and overwhelming and beyond our wildest dreams. How can we not have some sense of, of fear? But when this word is used of God, its primary meaning is reverence and awe. So Solomon is telling us that the truly knowledgeable person, 
the one who has a good moral compass, the one who really knows God, will stand in awe of God. What does it mean to stand in awe? We realize, first of all, he's God and we're not. If God's word says something, it says it. We don't have the power or the authority to change it. God said it. You better believe it. And you better not change it. Because that's his word, not yours. He's God. We're not. If you don't like the way he's running things, when you get your own universe, you can be your own God. But God is God. That's how much we need to realize he's God. It's not up to me to tell God what to do. I stand in awe of him. I don't dare voice my criticism of how he's doing things. Not that he can't take that. Not that sometimes we don't. But we need to be careful. He's God. He is the creator, the sustainer, and the ruler of all things. He does hold our life in his hands. But he also loves us with a love that is crazy. A love that is outside of this world. A love that is beyond our wildest dreams. And he knows what is best for us. And it is in everything he does for us, he is promoting our best. Therefore, we not only stand in reverence of him because he's God, but we stand in reverence of him because he's God. He knows everything about me, and he still loves me. (laughs) He still wants to do everything that's best for me. He's still going to work everything to my good. To stand in awe of him means that we surrender our all to him every single day, and we give him the worth or the value that is due him. We worship him because he's God. We stand in awe because we know ourselves. And he knows us even better than we know ourselves. And he still did everything necessary to love us and to have us in relationship with him. And that is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom, to understand God is God and stand in awe of him. The opposite person is a fool. Fools have no desire to live as God desires. They have no desire to live according to God's standards. They also hate instruction. They don't like to be taught anything. They don't like to be corrected. And to actually be disciplined and to sit down and to learn something is a considerable waste of time to them because they already know. One of my favorite proverbs about the fool is they simply delight in airing their own opinion. They delight in airing their own opinion. Doesn't matter if it's based on facts or truth. They don't care. We have a lot of fools in our society. They delight in airing their own opinion. So as we look at Proverbs over the next several weeks, we have a choice. Wisdom or foolish. We can choose to learn God's way. We can turn, choose to listen to it and do it. Or we can go our own way and be a fool, suffering the consequences. So why Proverbs? Because God loves us. And he wants what's best for us. And what's best for us is to live life as he intended life to be lived. And that's what Proverbs teaches us. So as you uh, go through your week, as we go through our week, let's seek to be wise. And let's realize it begins by standing in awe of God. Let's stand and begin our week in that way.